a great pleasure and honor to be here in this uh, educational session. Although this is an educational session, I see my own teachers of the oligonucleotide field here sitting, like uh, Professor Eckstein and Mike Gate and a few others. So I'm so humbled and honored. And uh, I, before I want to start this, I want to uh, remind you that you are sitting in the analigo capital because of this chemist, Jack Van Boom, who developed the phosphotriester chemistry not too far from this building. And uh, in his successful career as an oligonucleotide chemist, he published something like 800 papers. And uh, he was the supplier of the oligonucleotide using his triester chemistry made from his lab, which led to the discovery of the ZDNA. At one time, he used to be the collaborator with uh, all the oligonucleotide structural chemistries this even before the therapeutic oligos came into existence. When the therapeutic oligonucleotides came to existence, he would think about all possible modifications. And to give one example, this very successful sulfurizing agent, which goes into every single oligonucleotide phosphorothiovates made now, which uses the reagent called PADS. The PADS was discovered in his lab. So these are some of the examples. And he inspired me also to think about this carbohydrate targeting. So Jack Van Boom is, uh, was here. So what I'm going to talk about is we are going to talk quickly talk about the single-stranded oligonucleotides like antisense oligos or anti-microRNAs or antimers or splice modulators. And then the double-stranded oligonucleotides like siRNAs, microRNA mimics are the also double-stranded molecules, aptamers and immune modulators. And Mark mentioned something like these 200 compounds which are in clinical trials, which use multiple, multiple mechanisms beyond these classes. So I may not be able to cover in the time allotted and in the history of this 30 years history of oligonucleotides, every single possible mechanism, so my apologies. So if you look at the same molecules based on the mechanism of drug classes, the first one and the most advanced one is the antisense oligonucleotides, or ASOs, and they are RNASH based and they work at the nucleus. And then the second one is small interfering RNAs, or siRNAs, uh, based on the RNA interference, and this happens in the cell cytoplasm. And the microRNA based, it also worked in the cytoplasm. This could be by stopping the function of the microRNAs using single-stranded then antimers, or if you are altering the function of the microRNAs by bringing microRNA mimics by the double-stranded species, that is microRNA mimics, that's also in the cytoplasm. Then there is a class of molecules which work by steric blocking the splice-switching oligonucleotides, which is also done very extensively in this place and which you will hear a lot during this uh, session later on. And this happens in the nucleus of the cell. <clears throat> and aptamers, which bind to proteins and alter the function of these proteins, this could be intracellular or extracellular. And finally, immune modulators. The immune modulators could be single-stranded based on the TLR uh, nine type mechanisms are double stranded based on this Rigai type mechanism, and it, this happens in the endosomes. And this is a quick based on the quick classification based on these mechanisms. And my job is to introduce basic chemistries so that you can appreciate bread stock and art stocks and the toxicology talk to follow my talk. So in the double-stranded siRNA RNA mechanism, we are introducing the synthetic molecule uh, on the, into the um, cell. And once this is taken up, and this is loaded, the antisense strand is loaded into the risk complex and finds the target message. And the slicer associated with the risk complex degrades the uh, message 
and then this catalytic process uh, repeats itself. On the other hand, the ant single strand antisense molecule when enters the cell, and again, it, uh, the, it's the nature, of mostly in the DNA in nature, once this finds the messenger RNA, the RNA-DNA hybrid is recognized by the RNAsh, and then causes the degradation, and then this um, molecule, single-stranded molecule, finds another copy of the message, recruits RNAsh, and this process repeats. We all know that. One physical property difference which I want to point out between the ASOs, which are single-stranded, and the double-stranded molecules shown here, beyond this molecular weight difference, is this molecule is flexible with one nanometer width, and these green ones are the aromatic bases. The hydrophobic uh, faces are exposed into the solvent faces or in the protein surfaces. On the other hand, in the double-stranded siRNAs, the aromatic uh, bases are paired and buried inside the duplex. So this is one strand, and that's the second strand, and mainly exposing the hydrophilic phosphate and the sugar surfaces. And this molecule tend to be more hydrophilic for that nature compared to the uh, single-stranded uh, base-exposed antisense molecule. And obviously, the molecular weight is uh, higher here. And these different physical and chemical properties result in this difference of pharmacokinetic uh, profiles. But in both cases, the message is the same, that we want to kill the messenger. We want to kill the messenger RNA by degradation. And it, interestingly, it goes through RNA3 mechanism, shown here. And this is the target message. And the a, a direct phosphate hydrolysis type mechanism, which is seen in the RNAs P, snake venom phosphodiesterase, nucleus P1, RNAs3, and RNAs H, and argonaut, it gives they are five prime phosphate at the three prime end of the message. And this five prime phosphate is the one which is recognized in this five prime race experiment for doing the PCR experiments to ascertain that this is what the molecular cleavage plays supposed to be, and we are uh, establishing the RNAi process. So this mechanism is common for both the single stranded processes and the double stranded processes. And when we are talking about 200 compounds which are in the clinical trials now, there are three approved oligonucleotide drugs. And this is the very first one, vitravine. And the second one, this is an antisense compound. This is the macrogen. This is an aptamer compound. And this is the kinamero, the APOB targeting compound in 2013. So this is also another antisense compound, more gapmer, as you know. Quickly looking at the vitravine, which is the foamy version, is a DNA phosphorothiovate, comprises of two chemistries, DNA and phosphorothiovate. It's a 21-mer. And I don't want to steal our Craig's thunder, but if you look back now, these molecules, you can immediately recognize this. This also has this, some CPG motifs. So this is not working just purely by RNAsh mechanisms. It also has multiple modes of mechanisms. But the important aspect, what I wanted to mention is, it is consisting of two different chemistries, DNA and phosphorothiovate. And this is, was approved during the Christmas time in 1998, and this is the uh, targeting the CMV IE2 gene, and this is for the treatment of the CMV-induced retinitis. And as a person who are, recollects the history always, I want to point out the importance of the deoxyphosphorothiovates. The phosphorothiovate chemistry is very, very important for oligonucleotide biodistribution, and it has been taken uh, advantage of this important biodistribution properties for multiple generations of antisense and also antimers and so on, because this phosphorothiovate is capable of transporting the oligonucleotides to kidney, liver, spleen, bone marrow, adipose tissue, muscle, and so on and so forth. And Brett would uh, add if there are something which I have forgotten. And the history of the phosphorothiovate goes back to 1966 by the discovery of Fritz Eckstein. And Fritz Eckstein, if you look at this Jack's paper, 
not only for in introducing this phosphorothiamate linkage and also predicting this favorable enzymatic stability, which is mentioned in this JAX communication. And this phosphorothiamate discovery was carried through by uh, <coughs> Wojtek Steck, and this is the paper by Steck and Zahn, which contributed to the yeah, practical synthesis of oligonucleotide phosphorothiamates in NIH, which is described in this JAX communication. And I mean, this is an email which I got in the 1998 from Stack after realizing the Vitravin approval that he was so excited. He was, so he sent an email uh, just thinking about the blessing what we got from this phosphorothiamates when the Vitravin was approved. But when we replace the phosphodiester from the phosphorothiamate, we all know that causes a diastereum issue because the, when we replace this oxygen uh, by the sulfur, we can replace this oxygen or the other oxygen. So this could lead to an SP isomer or the RP isomer. And this, based on this difference in the chirality or the handedness, right-handed or the left-handed. And this, uh, both of them affect the, differently the protein binding and different extent in the metabolic rates. But synthetically, in the CMC perspective, it causes 2 power n diastereomers, where n is the number of linkages in the oligonucleotides. And this issue has generated a yes, newly formed company called Wave Biosciences, where they are trying to make chirality-dependent phosphorothiamates. But what we are making now is the diastereomeric mixture of these oligonucleotides. And the difference in the properties uh, shown here in this crystal structure, the RP isomer where this S is sticking out doesn't interact much with this metal ion sitting here, and the SP isomer, which is sitting right, displacing this metal ion, stops some of this uh, the cleavage activity, so it slows down. So one other compound beyond the DNA, which is capable of activating RNSH, is this FANA compound, arabinofluoro, again with the phosphorothiamate to modulate the biodistribution, which is shown here. This is the fluoro up, and this is to show the difference between the arabinofluoro versus the ribofluoro. The arabinofluoro can exist mainly in the C2 prime endoconformer or the DNA-like conformer, and because of its, it's similar to the DNA, the deoxy compound, 2 prime deoxy compound, and that is the reason why it is capable of activating RNSH. On the other hand, the ribofluoro is a C3 prime endo, like RNA-like, and it doesn't activate RNSH. And it is interesting and funny and sad, sometimes when we talk about the fluoro compounds, people often confuse, even at the level of the FDA, between the Arabino compounds, and everything what we need to do for the ribo compound, they want us to you know, compare and contrast in terms of the properties. Now we move on to the second generation RNSH antisense drugs, like the successful methoxyethyl gapmer of ISIS, which is shown here. This is a 5105 motif, five units of Mo, 10 units of the deoxy, and five units of Mo shown here. Uh, in the structural form, and this gapmer designed to activate RNSH because of this 10 units of deoxyphosphorothiamate. This entire unit is having phosphorothiamate backbone, and as I mentioned, the wings consist of the MO and the DNA in the middle, in the gap, and one other design feature by the ISIS, all Cs are 5-methyl Cs, and the, in the DNA unit to address the CPG issues to overcome the TLR9 or to act as an antagonist for TLR9. And in the MO, this 5-methyl-C provides additional binding affinity towards the opposite G by a half a degree or something like that. But among these hundreds and hundreds of two prime modifications which are made over the past 20 years or so, these are the very successful and very important modifications you have to remember. And 
I, will, I have summarized them here. These are 2 prime methyl, 2 prime ribofluoro, 2 prime methoxyethyl, and the LNA modification, LNA modification due to Imanishi and Wengel, and the ISIS modification, the S isomer of the C8, which is the methyl homologue of this LNA, shown here. I have shown here all of them as phosphoro phosphodiester backbones, just to emphasize these two prime modifications. And that is, these, all these modifications, for one reason or other, they lock in this C3 prime endo conformation, or the N form, you can see the sugar looks like an N, or like an RNA conformer, so it has a preferential binding to RNA and increases the binding affinity in this conformational equilibrium. So when we have 2 prime O methyl or 2 prime fluoro or methoxyethyl, they all have this C3 prime endo preference. On the other hand, the, because of this locking from the 2 prime to 4 prime, in both cases, in the LNA and the C8 chemistries, they are locked into this C3 prime endo permanently locked. And the RNA modifications are, as I mentioned, provide the increased binding affinity to RNA. They provide enhanced nuclear stability. And they also provide chemical stability compared to the DNA because it slows down the depurination during synthesis and purification related to CMC and improve the metabolic stability in acidic compartments for the same reason. And they modulate the hydration and protein binding. For example, in the methoxyethyl, the increased hydration of the methoxyethyl group reduces to some extent kind of buffering capacity to the protein binding. So it modulates the protein binding. And in some cases, like this 2 prime methyl in LNA and 2 prime fluoro C8, they also change the hydrophobicity and alter the protein binding. And this is the hydration pattern, what I was talking about for the methoxyethyl. It has what is known as a double gauche effect coming from the four prime oxygen to the two prime oxygen, and also the second gauche effect from this oxygen to the extended ether oxygen here, which traps the water molecule and favors the hydration and buffers this protein binding effect, and also pre-organizes to the C3 prime endo, and which gives an entropic advantage in binding. And these reasons what I mentioned earlier in the LNA and the C8 chemistries, we lock the 2 prime to 4 prime to an additional methylene group, and that locks this into the uh, C3 prime endo conformer in this, uh, uh, show, as shown here, uh, in the locked form. And all this RNA mimics, when they are used in the single-stranded form, either as the ASOs or anti-MERS, they still require phosphorothiovates for pharmacokinetic properties. So this methoxyethyl as a phosphorothiovate, LNA as a phosphorothiovate, as C8 as a phosphorothiovate shown here. And when people talk about LNA chemistry, they kind of uh, not mention the advantages associated with the phosphorothiovates. It's usually the phosphorothiovate modulate the pharmacokinetic properties mainly, apart from this hydrophobic nature provided by the LNA or C8. Now let me move on to the next important mechanism in terms of the steric binding in the single strand molecules by the splicing modulation. You will hear a lot of talk later on from this exon skipping and so on. And these are the single-stranded molecules. I'm going to just point out three important chemistries so that you will be exposed to these chemistries and you will be able to uh, uh, appreciate the differences between these molecules. The first one is Sereptas PMOs or Marfalinos. These are six-membered molecules shown here, which has a neutral backbone through this amidate linkage dimethyl amino group attached to the phosphorus. These are neutral molecules, and these molecules are used uh, for, by the Serepta for splice modulation. 
And these are their second generation compounds using a peptide attached or the a cationic piperazine containing backbones. But this is the one which is now being used in the clinic by a Sarepta. An alternate compound, earlier compound, is this uh, Prosenza compound, which uses the 2 prime methyl and phosphorothiovate combination that is shown here. That is for the same application for eliminating the exon 51 in this DMD application. That uses the, this is the second chemistry which I wanted to point out for this steric binding uh, application. The third one is uh, Frank's uh, methoxyethyl uniform phosphorothiovate molecule, which alters the, uh, the SMN protein in SMN2, correction of this SMN2 gene to retain the exon 7 to provide this functional protein. And this is being developed by Isis and Biogen. And this is for an important uh, um, neuro application. So these are the chemistries which are in the advanced stage the third, the another one which is an emerging chemistry for the steric uh, binding or by the single standard processes is Chris Lyman's tricyclo uh, nucleic acids, which is by tying down and extending by a bicyclic system shown here through this five prime, six prime, seven prime, which is a five member ring and also a tricyclic system between the six prime and eight prime shown here. These molecules also, uh, RNA mimics because they provide increase in binding affinity, increase the hydrophobicity, and they have been used for a splice altering oligos uh, as well. So these are the another variation of the lock nucleic acid involving a tricyclic chemistry. Now let me come to siRNAs, and which are double-stranded molecules for the, all the reasons which I mentioned earlier, Making drugs out of siRNAs is also not easy and because of the charges, hydrophilicity, biostability, and immunogenic nature, and so on. This is the Stites crystal structure showing the water molecules associated with this double-stranded molecule to emphasize the improved or enhanced hydrophilicity or the quick clearance in the kidney. We address at alnylam this by three chemistry-based solutions. First one, we bring chemical modifications like 2 prime methyl, 2 prime fluoro, and phosphorothiovates at very selected positions to address the exonucleases, whereas the endonucleases are addressed by the 2 prime methyls and fluoro and few other new chemical modifications and inserting them into the double-stranded molecules. And that chemical changes reduce the immune stimulation and maintain the specificity, and because we are having fluoro-type chemistries, it en enhances the cellular delivery. And we are focused in the liver delivery of siRNAs, and we use two different approaches which are complementary. The first one is based on the lipid nanoparticles platform shown here, which packs 500 to 2,000 molecules of siRNA in a single nanoparticle, and this is a four-component system consisting of an ionizable cationic lipid, a PEG group, a cholesterol and phosphatidyl choline analog, which stabilizes the bilayer. And because of this APOE-mediated mechanism, this molecule, this lipid nanoparticles, are taken preferentially into liver hepatocytes. And because this has an ionizable lipid with the PK around um, PK of around 6.5, it causes this proton sponge effect in these endosomalytic uh, compartments and causes the release of this siRNAs very efficiently. And because of this lipid nanoparticles physical properties, they are administered intravenously. And this formulation is the one which is most advanced in our clinical trial for Petisaran, which is targeting the TTR for FAP patients. Alternatively, we are using another complementary subcuteness administration route in which we are directly conjugating the siRNA at the three prime end using this linker system, a trivalent Galnac system. And this trivalent Galnac system 
addresses the ACL or glycoprotein receptor expressed specifically in the liver hepatocytes, which is a overexpressed half a million copies receptor in the liver hepatocytes cell for each cell, which has a, a quick turnaround in 15 to 20 minutes for the function of garbage cleaning, the dead proteins basically, and we are using that mechanism to attach to our payload of siRNAs, so they are taken very efficiently, and we are using this for subcutaneous administration, and we are having at Alnylam about 15 compounds in the clinic, in the development stage, six or seven compounds in the clinical trials, and six of them use this Galnac technology. And this technology has a wide therapeutic uh, window, and we are happy to see that now this Galnac platform is being taken and used by uh, ISIS and also Regulus and others because of the success of the targeting to ACL glycoprotein receptor. Yeah, another approach for delivery of the siRNAs is by Arrowhead using this DPCs or a polymer support, which is shown here by illustration by their compound ARC520. And this is a two-vial uh, formulation. And the first one is the lyophilized powder, which contains this polymer, in this case, a peptide. And this peptide has this, through a CDM bond, uh, Galnac targeting moiety, and it has, because it's the HPV, they have uh, cholesterol conjugated molecules in the second vial, and, and this is administered so that the, once the molecules are in the cells, this, they will use this endosomalytic release property associated with this uh, peptide backbone, which has the CDM linker and which is targeted by the Galnac moiety. The basic chemistry is at the inside the endosomes, when the pH drops, this leads into the separation of this amine group and the formation of this anhydride compound, leading this to this protonated uh, amine, which causes this endosomalytic release from this CDM linker, which is an elegant chemistry associated with this. But there are some CMC issues may be associated with the CDM linker, but Arrowhead is taking this compound for their clinical trials. Now, I have about four minutes to cover this, this 10 different mechanisms. I will give one slide for this microRNA pathways. When the microRNA is formed from the pre-microRNAs uh, and comes into the cytoplasm, and, and by they function like this siRNAs, they load into the risk, and once they're loaded into the risk, they can interact with the other proteins. This uh, antisen strand can interact with the other mRNAs and cause the translation repression. And this could lead to the secondary effects in these various proteins in the various pathways. For that reason, these microRNAs are the regulators. And if this is, we need this microRNA to modulate some good proteins, we can add these microRNAs by this microRNA mimics as a double-stranded synthetic molecule similar to the siRNAs, and we can bring that. But on the other hand, if this microRNA causes some unwanted proteins, and we may want to stop the function of this microRNAs, then we can bring an antisense molecule for the microRNA, and we can stop the function of this microRNA. And for example, here, this is our, one of our antimer or antagomer designs where we had a cholesterol conjugate which will go inside and find the microRNA 122 and stop the function of the microRNA 122. So these are the two different mechanisms for the microRNA pathways and uh, Regulus and Mirogen and Mirna are advancing their uh, pipeline through either of these uh, mechanisms. And aptamers are single-stranded folded oligonucleotides that bind to protein targets with high affinity and uh, specificity, and they are used for diagnostic as well as therapeutic applications, and they have this potential of being rival to antibodies. And uh, from thanks to John Rossi and others, 
They can also be used as targeting ligands. And as I mentioned earlier, macrogen is the approved uh, oligonucleotide drug, which is shown here. This is targeting the VEGF 165 uh, for age-related macular degeneration. This is the, consists of three different chemistries, RNA chemistries from here, and the pyrimidine 2 prime fluorose shown here, and then the red purine 2 prime methyl chemistries, all phosphodiester, and with the five prime end with the branched PEG molecule, and the three prime end with the inverted DT. And this compound is an aptamer, as I mentioned, binds to this VEGF-165. A similar compound which has been uh, advancing now is the Fovista, which is against the PDGF, and which is, a, again, a high affinity binder to this PDGF protein. There's a similar composition, uh, like a, it is attached to the 50 KD PEG. On the, interestingly, another class of aptamers by the Noxon or the Spiegelmers based on the yellow sugars of the nucleosides. These are shown here with the L RNA and the L2 prime modified compounds and so on. And they also follow for the PK advantage conjugation to the PEG. Interestingly, the metabolic fate of these compounds is not known because the L isomers, they won't be used by the nucleases in the same fashion. As a final word in giving one example from the immunostimulatory field, I will just point out the CPG motif can be an agonist for the TLR in the endosomes, and that can be taken advantage when we really want to activate TLR9. On the other hand, if you want to stop that function and if you want to use only the antisense part of the molecule, then people have introduced the 5-methyl at the C, and this overcomes the TLR9, and now it functions as the antagonist. So what I have tried to show in the given time was giving you an overview of the different classes of molecules, whether it is antisense or siRNAs or microRNAs or splice-switching oligos, aptamers or immune modulators. And I want to thank you for your patience and listening. This kind of uh, a random talk put together, I'm sure I didn't mention or give the appropriate acknowledgments or acknowledgments who contributed to this vast amount of chemistry and the information, but uh, thanking them all and thinking about them all and thanking you, all of you here on a Sunday morning assembling here. Thank you.